Hi there, welcome to IndyCar on the 22nd of April. Now, uh, you probably know that I've been saying for a little while now that uh, the national newspaper, which um, purports to be the only newspaper in Scotland which supports independence, has been putting out a few kind of questionable uh, headlines recently. And one appeared today which I think requires a bit of uh, debunking and explanation. And the headline was that the Scottish uh, Railway Network was facing uh, a nationwide strike. Now, the headline itself uh, doesn't go into great detail about who is striking, but the fact of the matter is it's not ScotRail that's striking. The strike is being organised by unions um, which whose members um, run what's known as RailTrack. Now, RailTrack is an arm's length company set up by the British government which manages and maintains the railway track infrastructure across the entire UK, including the Scottish Railway Network. Now, there's a, a bizarre uh, demarcation here, which I never understood, because ScotRail, which runs the train services in Scotland, is now owned by us, by the Scottish public, and it's being run for our benefit and not for profit anymore. The trouble is that for some strange reason, um, when devolution took place, although we have full control over our road network and other vital infrastructure in Scotland is also devolved, the one thing that's not devolved um, in terms of fixed ground-based infrastructure in Scotland is the railway track. And that leaves us uniquely vulnerable to any kind of strike action taken by um, British trades unions who work for RailTrack, which of course is basically an English company um, owned and run by the British government in London. So we have this strange situation where ScotRail, which is publicly owned and runs the trains, is having to face a national strike by British uh, track workers who work basically for a completely different organisation. And yet this is being presented to us by the National as a problem which is appears to be on the face of the headlines a uniquely Scottish problem, which it definitely is not. And again, it's disappointing to see this coming from the National, that their headline writers and their sub-editors are using the same basic techniques that have been used across the United Kingdom newspapers for years, which is basically a clickbait headline to make you angry so that you will read the actual newspaper. Now, it could quite easily have had a different headline, um, but for some reason that wasn't done. And anyway, I just wanted to make clear to you that this potential railway strike is nothing to do with rail track. Uh, sorry, it's nothing to do. Let's get this right way right. It's nothing to do with ScotRail. ScotRail has no control over the tracks that their trains run over. And this is something which I think the Scottish government needs to do something about even before we have our independence referendum. I think the, the devolution settlement needs to be adjusted because it would be quite straightforward for every um, railway line let's say, internal to Scotland, not the cross-border main tracks, the east and west coast main lines. They, they could still fall within the purview of the British Rail Track uh, Maintenance Group. But in Scotland, any, any place else in Scotland that doesn't go to any other part of the United Kingdom should really be broken away. And the workers who currently are employed to look after those tracks by rail track could easily transfer over to employment with ScotRail, and I don't see why that can't happen. It's um, it's like a forgotten loophole that's been left there, and it's probably been left there deliberately by the British government because it's a handy way of reining in ScotRail if, as it has done recently, uh, gets taken back into public ownership. So again, it's one of these sort of choke leads that have put on uh, the Scottish government to prevent it from doing what it needs to do, which is looking after its own railway tracks. Now, there is good news today, and um, the first bit of good news is that Nicola Sturgeon has announced that there will be a Scottish Government response on the scale of the COVID response, a national response, to the so-called cost of living crisis. Now, the cost of living crisis is not some um, random act which we have zero control over. The only reason we have zero control over it, incidentally, at the moment, is because we don't control our own natural resources. They are basically taken away from us and sold off to uh, private enterprises, which then export our energy onto the open market. But the, the rise in fuel costs and the rise in prices are all linked together. And it would appear that the international markets have been buying and selling commodities 
and profit taking off the back of this, primarily to make up for the losses that they took during the COVID pandemic. The dressing it up as something that we can't control and it's random and it's happening across the globe. But the fact of the matter is that it's the free market which is profit taking. And it is basically shoving the prices up to try and make as much money out of us as possible because they didn't make any money during the COVID pandemic. However, the First Minister, as I've said, has promised that the Scottish Government will put together a public aid package. Uh, they've outlined one or two of their proposals in their manifesto for the local government elections. But I think this is a much wider spread plan because if you're looking at the, the cost of living crisis as a crisis on the same scale, a national scale, the same as COVID-19 was, then it needs to mobilise everybody across every layer of public life. So that is everything from central government down through local government, all the way down to you and I as citizens. And it means we're all going to have to help each other because there isn't any other way around it. The Office for National Statistics and the British Chambers of Commerce have been reporting big drops in sales in retail recently as people tighten their belts and the huge rise in energy prices, the 54% rise in the energy cap, which we all know about, has caused everybody uh, to stop buying so much food, uh, to cut the amount of fuel they're using, to cut the amount of car journeys they're making, and basically to stop buying stuff. Now that's going to cause a recession. And a recession is a self-feeding uh, vicious cycle. The less people buy, the poorer the economy gets, the more job losses there are. And this is being fueled even further by the Bank of England deciding to put up the base lending rate, which means that those of us who still have a mortgage or a car loan or any kind of, of other credit which is linked to the, the rate of lending, will find that their repayments have gone up, which is going to make their lives even harder than they already were. So fuel prices are rising, the Bank of England adding to the chaos now, by very clumsily raising interest rates, because they think that that will damp down inflation. But the price inflation we're seeing is not being driven by the public, it's being driven by free marketeers in the global market. So this will have zero effect. And in fact, the Bank of England's base, uh, base rate rise, and there are, are more of them on the way, incidentally, are going to cause the situation to get worse and not better. So whatever the Scottish Government is planning to do to help mitigate this, it is going to uh, need the help of every citizen to make it work. The Scottish Government, as you know, has a very limited budget and it has to stay within that budget. So if it is to help people through this next phase of the manufactured crisis, the free market manufactured crisis that we all face, then there will have to be cuts in other services someplace else because we have a fixed budget and we don't decide what that is. That's decided by London. They take all of our taxes and then they decide what they are prepared to give us back. And of course that is a shrinking amount of money as the British government tightens its belt as well. So we are looking at a very difficult year ahead uh, and for the First Minister to make an announcement that she's planning to mobilise all of the uh, forces under her control to try to help people in these situations, they're going to have to target that aid at those in the most need. The rest of us are going to have to help each other, cut our expenditure, and to try to get through the next few months as best we can. There is some other good news today, and that is that 50 Ukrainian orphans who were uh, brought to Scotland amid an enormous amount of resistance from the British Immigration Service by the, the charity set up by Hibernian Football Club and Scottish politicians have finally started to settle in, in the new home and calendar. And uh, two of the youngsters who were interviewed in the press today, uh, a 16-year-old girl who's, um, who's currently now living, I think, in Edinburgh, and, and another young man, a 16-year-old young man, who is also helping the house mother, one of the carers, to look after the younger children. Now, they're settling in well, and they like Scotland very much. They think it's a beautiful country, and the people are friendly. But obviously, they miss home. They miss Ukraine. And so the Scottish authorities, the education authorities, are doing their best to provide, first of all, some English language tuition for the children so that they can understand what is being said, and also so that um, they are able uh, to integrate a little bit into Scotland. But remember, we're viewing these children as being here temporarily as our guests, 
we're not trying to repatriate them in here as, as Scots. They're not migrants. They're here temporarily. And we have to remember that when the children are being taught in school, we have to respect their cultural identity and we have to respect their cultural expectations and the way they're taught and what they're taught. So there are great efforts going on within the Scottish education community to make sure that the education that they receive is similar to what they would have had in Ukraine and that there are translators available to help them through their lessons. Now, the children obviously are very adaptable uh, but they've had a huge long journey and they've obviously been very tired and they're finally now settling in and their carers are beginning to say that the children are now relaxing. They're smiling, they're happier, they're beginning to make friends here. So this is a great Scottish success story and it's just a shame that it's the only one that was possible. It's great that it was done and it's an amazing piece of charity work by all of the Vernian supporters who incidentally set up their charity way back in 2017 with the football match and it's been going on ever since. They've been helping the children in this orphanage all of that time and when war broke out it was they who basically bust their sinew to try and bring them here and finally succeeded. So it's a great Scottish success story and I think we need to remember that we are as a country much more capable of being welcoming. We do not have this Brexit mentality of send them back where they came from and they're not welcome here. And I'm glad about that because you see that across so many countries at the moment. Far-right politicians sneaking in and the back door. We're seeing this in France at the moment with the rise of Marine Le Pen. If the daughter of the former uh, leader of the far-right party in, uh, in France now softening her image and trying to win votes uh, against e Emmanuel Macron. Now it looks as though Macron will win, but it's always worrying when the far-right starts to increase its voter share any any place else. Thankfully in Scotland we don't have that and I hope we never do. There's one other piece of news which um, crossed my news feed this morning and that is that Brian May, the former bass player from the very very famous band Queen, is a big fan of Scotland and spends a lot of his time living in Scotland, travelling around B&Bs and walking in the Highlands and he's apparently told the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon that he believes that Scotland and England are very different countries and in his opinion Scotland should become independent and I think he sees this as a necessity for Scotland to preserve what it is, preserve its culture, to preserve its, um, its social morality, uh, its different view of everything and also to preserve the wildlife here which he values very highly and something which I think is rare in England to find as much wild space as we have here. So it's interesting we see more and more um, personalities from the media, from sport, actors, you know, basically A-list a actors, musicians of all kinds from all different countries all saying the same thing, that they all believe that Scotland should become independent, not separate itself from the rest of the United Kingdom, but run its own affairs and set its own standards. And I think that's interesting that someone like Brian May should say that, because I never actually pegged him as being someone who even thought about Scottish independence. So it's very nice to see that. And I hope that uh, other um, English and British, of, of anybody from the United Kingdom outside of Scotland, holds that opinion, especially those who are so well known. Anyway, that's about it for me today. I tried to time today's broadcast uh, so I didn't overlap on Indy Truck Davy. I know he was on earlier on. I hope I haven't trod on anybody's toes today. But I'll be back again, I hope, on Sunday uh, with some more details for you. In the meantime, remember that Scotland is a different place. Uh, we demonstrate that daily, and we have to keep demonstrating that daily. For the First Minister and the Scottish Government, we need to remember that the SNP, despite its shortcomings and despite some of the mistakes that it's made over the years, it is a party of government, and so it is not free to simply uh, come up with a plan for independence which does not include the day-to-day -day running of the country. Their first job, incidentally, as a government at any time while they're in office is to run the country. So it's not a surprise to me that the independence referendum will be worked on by a completely different set of people from the Scottish Government because it, it needs to be. The, the First Minister can't spend a lot of time on it. She's already snowballed 
under with so many different things to deal with. We've had COVID, we've had the, the crisis in the war in Ukraine, we've got the cost of living crisis now, we've got all the mess left by the Tories, we've had Brexit, so many things that the British government has got wrong. Um, I noticed today, incidentally, in another little aside, that Boris Johnson is now planning to use Scotch whisky as a bargaining tool in his negotiations with the Indian government. And he's trying to get them to relax the 150% uh, tariff that there currently is on imported whisky into India. In India at the moment, most whisky is made by a single plant. And as far as I remember, it was um, Scottish distillers who went there and set this up so that India had its own Scotch whisky plant. The problem is that if the British government wants to do a trade deal with the Indians, Boris Johnson has to use Scotch whisky as one of his major uh, chess pieces in these negotiations. And it's not certain at the moment that the Indians will relax those uh, very tight regulations and tariffs on Scotch whisky. If they did, it would mean a boon for Scotch whisky or perhaps a billion pounds more in exports. But right now, it doesn't look likely that Narendra Modi, Narendra Modi is going uh, to soften his stance on this just yet. So Boris Johnson has a very hard job ahead of him, despite all the photo opportunities that he's been engaged in. He's been seen wearing turbans and, um, uh, and basically dressing up to look a little bit like, um, like monks and so on. It's the usual Tory window dressing. But whether he'll get a trade deal with India, I don't know. But even if the first series of negotiations which appear to have gone reasonably well, even if that carries on, a deal on Scotch whisky is more than a year away at least. At the very earliest, uh, it would be the end of the year before they come up with any kind of provisional draft of a free trade agreement with India. And remember, the British government is hamstrung because the Indian state will want free movement for their people to move back and forward between India and the United Kingdom. And that is going to <laughs> really piss off all the hardline Brexiteers and the racists that the Tories have been pandering to. So it's a tricky one for Boris. I'm not sure he's ever going to manage this, but at least he is off our screens in the UK at the moment and is currently pantomiming being a uh, an international statesman at the moment in India. Anyway, that's it for me today. But just remember, Scotland is a different place. We have different values and different culture, but we also respect other people's cultures, particularly the children who have been uh, invited to Scotland as our guests to stay here until it's safe for them to return to Ukraine. As I say, I'll be back again on Sunday. In the meantime, keep the faith. Let's not get divided. And remember that newspaper headlines, even in the national, can be misleading. So always read the rest of the article and find out what the truth is. We'll see you soon. Bye for now.